Welcome to the audio version of Tugboat. It's the third volume in a Wild Rider series published in 2017. Audio version narrated 2021. Created by Rock and Roll Sailor. Shortly after World War II, in Flanders fields where poppies grew, there were toady old canal barges where defunct Harley bikes left over from the Yankee man. The angular pull from the heavy barges meant that inevitably with the passing of time the bike frame would get so warped that only the one working it all day and night would still manage to ride it out on a straight line and through the bends, unleashed. Such are our lives. be built to push and tow your whole life rather than fancy yachts prancing in protected waters with harbor trawling captains and their catch of the day live without neither mercy nor remorse pushing square headed through the rippling waters of tomorrow's yesteryear like ramming a pram through the busy bustling early hour streets on the way to daycare indiscriminate of the cargo and the barge or the kid in the pram. Well, honey, I woke up drunk from yesterday and I'm still standing all systems go. Laughter broke out through the neon tinted night. I said thanks man, stuff like that makes my day. I was sat here drooping over my coffee. And you just, yeah, you just made me laugh, just what I fucking I needed. A guy and his pretty bird coming out of a bar in the middle of the night and the guy says, well honey, I woke up drunk from yesterday and I'm still standing. I love it, keep living it bro. Friday night, folks to see, dope to deal, you understand, fuck yeah. Whatever man went his way again just like he always does. Looking for his wherever love in the shadows of tomorrow. A dance away from another reality. How dawn breaks down the mystique of night in the dewdrops of bird song. Shivering expectancy itself sets a free song rippling, calling from the atmosphere and cracking through the shreds and shards of dreaming and nuit blanche crackling with bioelectric static at the hours when lovers grow pale and candles sputter out of existence and you either curl and cuddle up or shimmy softly abruptly to the far side of the bed stretching the sheets like a white flag over the war zone of love and lust and all its faces its shapes its forms its glowing dark in the red of night its summer dresses its perfect laughter its sweet caress its utter silliness saying let the drama wait till after morpheus has passed me by cause i'm too drunk to drive or even walk out of here Wear my shoes, oh slumber, veil my switch back to daily blame me so I can be discreet about my indiscretions and continue with my daydream routine of musts, have nots. Or, in juxtapose, oh fuck so great, I've never felt like this before, don't let it show too much, be calm, be wise, be... Be what? Cool? Be hot, be cold, be your experience, but don't go being cool because you have to, because guess what? That's so fucking uncool. I mean, 
cool, cool becomes a cold code when it becomes a rule. Routine and forced paradigm by which to live and die. It ain't cool no more. Back in the day of wood stoves and creaks in the walls more than plaster, people would say it's something good that it was hot. Steamy like the locomotives or sex under heavy blankets in a freeze and fucking alcove or a long-standing slow boiling pot of soup. But in the days of echo and polyester duvets, people just want to be cool. Till you get such a fucking popsicle mentality that everybody melts away when reality burns through the wrapper of everyday life. The great unknown snarling in the midnight sky. Neon saber two tiger mask flashing like a beacon. Fractured anger towering icons of paper mache. While the torches have crystallized to key ring leads. Making me wonder what the next hot cool thing to say, way to walk, think and talk will be when everybody's finally chilled, warmed up, cooled out, moved into passive houses. Nobody fucking moves or what? Pacified. We're all in homeostasis with one another and just let me know what frequency you're on. Cool heart, yeah. Let's create living buildings like rabbit burrows and termite hills with elevators going slow enough so you can pick your veggies from a vertical garden on your way up or down. Hard house, beehive, organic community structures where there's fish in the pond and a herb garden overhead. Organic fiber plastics that you just grind through the compost mill and expired or re-extruded leisure. Pedal sun, air, hydro, wind powered vehicles that carry the traffic over solar roads. Schools where you learn to lean into the future rather than reach you the past by cloning the crew that filled those seats before you. Like you lean into the strong winds of the arms of a lover for comfort, passion, reassurance, sleep, dream time. Dream time, dream time, wake up to the dream time. Ancient song carried along song lines by native Australians and since a few decades by hippies, travelers, searchers, researchers, adventurers and diasporic new world renegades that can hold a tune and remember a line or two of lyrics. Dream time, dream time, we dream up the future. Through our minds, words, and actions. And thus we are the fluttering hurricane raising butterflies, our emotions circumventing the globe with every spasmodic jerk of our puppet mind strings, where in fact none are there. Which is sailing the frequencies of biospaceship earth. No strings attached, and the masochist is there of his own free will. The rider through the night, fully aware that no dawn is ever still called tomorrow in the momentary haze surrounding the quickening sunburst of first light. When the rabbits reap their daily dewy harvest of grass, and the early day shift ants stake over walking the chemtrail that the night shifters left hot and steaming with ant anticipation. Life is a theater piece that no stage can hold. Therefore, shine a searchlight on the universe and the future alike. Or rather, accept the darkness that gives birth to the light of the sun's birth close and far away. As the idea of tomorrow is born out of the darkness of the night. As we dreamily weave webs like dream catchers for a good hunch. A simple gesture of gratitude. A bus that's waiting when you come running. Or a kid that miraculously just decided to calmly get washed and dressed this morning. A lover that takes the time between yawns to ask if you slept well and would you like some breakfast. So many little dreams to make come true. To pull through. To make you. 
We all squander a lot for a simple few, too often neglecting all those little dreams when they do come true, simply because we're so busy dreaming up fucking new ones, we forgot to take bloody notice. Take notes, selfies, power your points and dress your words, you ride your video tube till the foam splashes overhead like an ocean orgasm and you ride out or die. Virtually. Virtuous. real. Till reality sinks in, what did you dream, wish, anticipate, create, negate, ordinate, masturbate, defecate, ejaculate, regurgitate? Whiskey for breakfast and it's two in the morning, each his own poison, each their own taste. As always, diversity is the skeleton. Finally, we start priding ourselves in health and all around balanced well-being, balanced communications. A new age, new wage, new wager, new take on what we've always had to be to the inner core of our being's survival-driven selves. Homo universalis. The universal human. this earth and recognize just with how many species we share these survival conditions, this environment, this fragile, resilient, mysterious earth, this multitude of ecosystems overlapping and influencing one another in so unoverseeably many ways. We are to them the worst exterminating colonists imaginable. Horrific. Gruesome, that part that we describe as barbaric, inhuman, indecent, unforgivable, punishable, shameful, disgusting, terrifying, gross, unadmittable, for which there is no fucking defense nor argument in favor when executed against other humans, so intraspecies as it were, we perpetrate the whole of our surroundings with just that approach, exterminate, level, drill, excavate, re-coordinate, cut into the veins and melt into boiling lead, steel or gold, like we tap the life blood out of the working plankton human, we tap the life force from this living earth, this space ball ship that we as a species find ourselves on with no certainties and plenty to debate about. labor of fools. That's what we live by. All our emotions come into play as the masses grow in numbers and their groupings amass in even more numbers to crunch, feed, and shelter. Even more voices around a communal global table. Funny how we somehow needed Star Trek aliens, stellar portals, and pool blue stargates to understand that being different is okay and does not necessarily require blood feuds and sacrifice to the universal pecking order through wars and ignorant dreams of submission and dominance. The self-inflicted sadist believe the masochist controls him. Like warmongers claim their invasions valid in the face of fear dreamed and trumped up threats and dangers. Handing out free saber tooth tiger masks in moles and sports stadiums, migration checkpoints and overseas colonies. Meanwhile, B-movies did more for releasing the global subconscious from its bounds of terrified silence than any group therapy can ever wet dream over. 
let alone any politician. To unabashedly listen to the crackling, cackling, creaking, shrieking, melodiously mooing, the voice of the beast that is the human species. And it has gathered so innumerably many cells that each or individual human being is distinct yet bound, organized, collected, coerced, compelled, commissioned, created. And not to inflict a decimating, suicidal, catastrophic Armageddon insight beyond which there's naught but devastation and gruesome suffering or heavens beyond the grave. Not funny, unproductive, idiotic, doesn't make any fucking sense. This ain't Holly nor Bolly nor Nollywood. Heroism doesn't lie in gun-toting rhetoric and destructive sacrificial power play. Seat planting simply in consistency. Honestly aware of what you sow and reap and in what condition you leave the land, the planet, the bed, the desk, the altar. And learning to accept, respect, and enjoy the given feel that there will always be a fraction too much friction, and you wouldn't want it any other way. Really, you're on the controls of your vibes, so switch that dial at frequencies don't match to your ideas. Learn to auto tune and quit launching that joystick pants rock five times a week and still expect to attract a mate or have some color. It just takes free mindedness and a will to care. Take notice rather than handing them out. Work hard, party harder. Knowing that everything has a will to live. And realizing that every abuser is a hero. So I'd say more humans, less heroism. Because in its spirit, true heroes die of old age after giving their life one day at a time. push and pull at our societies, we all do. From the most conservative underwear under the pajamas to pay, to the most anti-anti-ants mohawk sporting punk. From the flower dress formica idolizing suburb mom with a fetish for bubble gum after blowjobs, to the tree hugging mud fucking green fairy love junkies. From the hidden in the university library genius nerd to the self-declared bar-hugging dispenser of foul whiskey breath and common sense wisdom. From the ignorant, the sparkingly fresh wit of an inquisitive kid to the reminiscent babblings of a toothless, hairless, stone sperm dry wound elder. We all tug and push at our lives, our surroundings. Our societies, nations, continents, and world of worlds. Through the rippling minds of those that surround us. Through the storms of media hypes, fashion, the freezing economic lethargy, the deafening concrete inertia, and the actual winds and rain sleeting and numbing. The terrifying nuisance of being mortal, therefore vulnerable to tear and wear. and therefore demonstratively alive and kick in even if it's just another dead dog or to check for quicksand on the way to the Fata Morgana of continuity and tomorrow's reverie. We're voicers. Jung called it archetypes. Freud's constipating opium made him dub it frustrations. We used to just call it gods and humors, the magic of places and the folly-inducing ways of beguiling strangers. And though rationality seemingly superficially cleaned that off of our formica-topped kitchen table minds, 
We still travel to the enchantment of Paris, the hustle of Hong Kong, or the red-lit weed mists of Amsterdam, as if the Oracle of Delphi will bestow us there with random wisecracks and observations from the Book of Fools, the largest volume of human history known in all galaxies and best recognized as a potent absurdist antidepressant, also helpful against sudden bouts of hubris or imperatrosis, and always a classic good read by the fireplace or the, the shiny twinkle of the many suns far away. And who or what do we worship anyways? According to cats, we're naught but their servants, some while deservant of a little cuddle. While we ourselves still induct new gods to immortality and and demigods and quarter gods and kilo gods and half ounce gods and one eight and a quarter gods and neighborhood gods and sacred bar angels that suit comfort and turn on just by pouring your drink and the very odd beat street golden copper god that knows to the minute when to stand at attention to guide lady granny scaling scolding and daring the crossroads of crazy traffic no need to help just make sure they clear the way before she does we induct national gods like founding fathers and presentient presidents and knowledgeable kings and prime ministers that actually know and live the meaning of prime, be a prime number and remain undivided in your way of unifying an acceptance of diversity. Worldwide divinities like Pele god of football and Thatcher god of goddess of stiff-headedness Bowie, god of character and the rising phoenix, or Calo, la sagrada vegetalista, or James Brown, the gold coffin god of soul, and Elvis, god of ephedrine hip shaking, or Horta, god of the natural curve, or Van Gogh, lord of lucid dreaming colors, Leonard Cohen, god of crude intelligence and wayer of poetic justice, Nusrat Fateh Ali Khan, god of him, and Um Kalsum, goddess of descending and rising passions, and of course, Freddie Mercury was, as always, the messenger god. Mandela, god of calm self-belief and patient wiseness. Hitler, god of hatred and self-destruction. Gandhi, god of defiance and abnegation. Two vegetarians that handled their aggression in totally juxtaposed ways. One destroying a continent and, in doing so, bringing to the boiling surface of worldwide societies the biases and toxin-laden swords hidden amongst the opinions of any nation that flies too close to the sun. The other creating a nation that's a world unto itself and home to a world of gods. And if the gods can cope, exist, then so can we. Yeah, if the gods can coexist, then so can we. If humans allow a seat for all of its humors and her feelings at the rounded table of its mind, then the humors and feelings of any human become in time and experience recognizable and therefore meetable, not therefore acceptable, but handleable, since the angles and corners are within our mental emotional grasp. And that's all it takes to coexist. Recognition. Simultaneously being aware of your own existence and that of everyone, everything, everywhere around you as being distinctly unique in a self-regulatory, as it is, interdependent. Valuable on relative scales that we cannot know the measure of, we cannot fathom. I mean, the concept of total knowledge is a brain fry. Forests grow over the corpses of desiccated searchers of ancestral wisdom and everlasting bliss. The asylums pile up with the seers and those plagued by visions, voices and furies failing to accept these energies within their framework of normality, that obligatory stone bed of societal acceptability where in fact it's up to society as a group of individuals to learn to accept its members as limbs and senses of the body, the species, the being human, the human being. We all act out the folly, fury, madness, fear, mockery and beastliness, divinity, sages, savageness of our being, the human being. As we run up and down the spiral staircase of our DNA, 
be it in the bedroom or the boardroom or the supermarket alley, the parking lot, bumper fights or courtoisies. We worship actresses and actors that portray and enlarge our plentifold ways of being, feeling, thinking, acting or not. Oftentimes we watch them do and undergo things we gladly or law-abidingly don't, but for the resonance of their actions on the gong in their guts, the ricochet and rumbling ringing in the back of your neck, the tingling surge in the small of your back, we worship them like gods, demigods, quarter gods, heroes and heroines, the stress-releasing, biochem pumping, neuro-equalizing, tranquilizing mirror world that is the others. And if that's hell, it's up to you just as much as them. Just bear in mind it's simply easier to alter the focus of your own impressions than the world of another like any microscope aficionado can vouch. And any stargazer can testify. Often it's the looking glass that needs a cleanse and a little adjusting to recognize the whatsoever mirror man having it on what is wherever's mirror woman on the kid's trampoline in the backyard while the moonlight pales the sweat on their skin to diamonds in the night sky. Gender neutrality. Who the fuck ever came up with a word like gender neutrality for fuck love's sake? You want to speak of sexual existence, equality, life-defining natural preference of sexual components to your relations with other humans? And it's defined, defied, defiled, and obstinately negated by the term itself? I mean, gender creepy neutrality, not even androgenity, I mean, neutered? It should be full gender awareness, extreme sexual respect, worship of the lustful love that the urge to live expresses itself through in our physical beings and raging hormones. Do we feel the need for procreation of the zillions of bacteria and freaking freaky parasites that live within us, as symbiotically as we make our cell phones, pets, kids and spouses do? Or is it all our personal sex quest, need for attention and giving it, pumping it, rolling and rocking it till the break of day, the bed or your back, whichever comes first, as long as we come together? Gender neutrality just sounds like eunuchs galore, the booze up at the AA, getting high in the basement. Not let love have as many faces as it does, as long as no innocent parties are harmed and the neighbors can get either some sleep or inspiration while you're doing it. Fine, fuck, enjoy it, and please do it with someone that you can huddle, cuddle, and squeeze up with before, during, and especially afterwards. Unless it's someone like me that gets flashes of inspiration and starts writing, painting, recording, well, and tattooing, suing, or whatever after sex. It's just good for you both, or a many whatever. I once met a lady happily coexisting with a Shih Tzu for foreplay and a shepherd doll for the ride, after which the Shih Tzu came and licked up the mess, and they were a happy threesome. Not my advice, just one of many observations, many, many observations. I still hear her laughing, saying how they hated cats, but they loved pussy. Anyway, how indiscriminate is it to forbid certain dog breeds and bases of race? We do it to animals as we do it to ourselves. Our industrial farms and slaughterhouses are set up like concentration camps and we're even too stupid to capture and siphon off the methane farts for fuel. Though fair enough, that's like digging for gold teeth through the stacked corpses. Yet as gruesome as that may be, 
That same indifference to pain, suffering, and horror is exactly what it takes sometimes to be a firefighter, a cop, a parent, a teacher, a lover, a soul, a child, a man, a woman, and any, any gender or combination thereof you are. A human being, a being human. We all are, though not willingly, no. As, as far as we know, we're forced into existence without much say into anything, not even or uneven. Unless you're born and bred, spoiled, kept immature, and destined to become a toddler tyrant of the house, the hood, or just as psychotic and sociopathic as it takes to function in the hierarchy of the beasts that are corporations. Creatures with the might and sway of today's multinationals would in days of old have been described as gods for the gifts of food and employ they bring and the fun and games they provide, and demons to the small companies they gorge up, the work folk they condemn to work, wage slavery, and the land they lay waste and barren like fire and brimstone had rained upon it and turned it all to desert. And why should that be the legacy of commerce? It's just such a fallacy to deprive your employees, who are ultimately part of your market, of the necessary standard of income and therefore of life and thus expenditure to acquire quality product, but rather make cheap pay cheap trash quickly and sit in the rubble drinking plastic soup. Bloody piss poor excuse for not having a clue of how to handle the power that comes with one to be a bigger than the rest. like those lousy, idiotic, full-on, loft-kill morons that castrate women out of fear for female sexual prowess. It's fucking insane. 90% of heterosexual male sexual strength and pleasure is in effect to the grandeur of female sexual pleasure, perpetuation, and pleasure. And you scaredly, scaredly scarify and sacrifice that? Share the life to celebrate, inaugurate, exemplify, amplify the continuum of the matter of love. Defying the vacuum of the void and empty so the thing absolutely not to do is defamate your partner's sexuality. Whether you're a depraved, scared, knife-wielding disfigurer of the vulva or an emasculating bourgeois bitch, I couldn't care less. You kill what you want, so beware. You kill what you want. Watch it die uncomprehending over and over and over again. The ones that want you. And the logical way of not being fully under the sway of these moronic power political psycho players from hell, Harvard or the hood is self-determination through individually taking back the production consumption process, the households navigation, the scenes on the screens create locally small-scale and mix, mingle, and experiment with the international intraspecial ingredients that are our different cultures. By now, landed everywhere. It's like the old habit amongst tribes to swap small numbers of live bodies so neither would come and burn the house down for fear of fighting family. Ultimately, and without ultimatum, becoming mixed families and stronger, brighter, more diverse tribes. Provide high quality, small quantity, instead of the more, 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 our troops need more, that permitted economic thinking ever since two world wars hit in short succession last century. In the short term, one can be a motor, a drive to economic growth and fast progress, but never in the long term, since the weight of prolonged wars or succession of wars will not only deplete the funds, allies and able bodies, but also, and most importantly, erode the quality and character of a nation's soul and infuse it with the sting of vengeance and the irony of dry blood and loss by victory, as there are none but victims on the battlefield from which no one returns the same, visibly scarred or not. Tugging, pushing, and towing at our nation's portions, food bowls, dinner plates, households, secrets, prides, prams, puddings, penises, barges, powerhouses, our pussies, wants, needs, guises, and guides, tearing and ripping at our clothes, tents, masks, and flags, makeup flaking as the bruised paint on the bow, 
The way wars rip the masks of societies like the facades blown off buildings, singe and burn through the veneer of daily life, and make demons and heroes out of ordinary people, usually within the same person. The way a mass anger takes control of the mob while the rest of the crowd leans back on the sofa watching it in between commercials and sitcoms, and somehow anticipating outcomes and questioning proceedings and siphoning off energies, emotions, thoughts and inexplicable urges towards the battlefields, the players, the unwilling gladiators. The way also that people individually, collectively withstand and defy, escape and evade, spit in the eye of suffering and oppression. The dragon of Tibet is dancing around the world and will forever perch itself upon the rooftop of the temple at the gates of Xanadu. The pain of being oppressed reminds us that the perpetrator is at all costs diverting his vulnerability towards its victims, lest they rise up and reverse the roles, turn the table and rattle the castle to their bones. Lately I asked some people why they were so embittered in their lives ways and they each individually proclaimed that they had through the hardships and blows that life had landed them, they had earned the right to be bitter. I didn't understand. I didn't understand until I thought about the bitterness of coffee and how invigorating that can be. Providing an alertness unlike any other sweet agony, life is an acquired taste. Bitter is the remedy. O oh, succulent morsels of remorse and tear-salted regret, let us gnaw our innocence from the bones of past possibilities that lie desiccating in the blistering heat of desire for more, better, harder, faster. Keep breathing faster, harder, in, out, in, out, in, out. Amidst this phallic worship of skyscrapers like men hears of triumph and collective hard-ons for progress and defiance of gravitas, inviting sky goddesses to plant themselves atop our everlasting erection and ride us into a future of technicolored orgasm while she screams out thunderbolts, rain clouds and rainbows till the earth shakes and shatters with the might of her arrival in Orgus Bay. Rattling the castles to their bones, liberated, unadulterated, above and way beyond any triple X rating, blissful, raw female sexual power and prowess, ramming atop the purple headed obelisk, throbbing with passion, lust for life, bursting with blood and boiling as the pulsing ties clench the womb like a vacuum suction pump, drawing the life force, the essence, the sperm crowd of little astronaut cells up and out of the sputtering towers soon to collapse and leave her agonized, angry and desiring everlasting more. And in that moment, the praying mantis bites the head off her partner and devours him whole as first food for her offspring, the flesh of the donor DNA easiest assimilated. And we wonder why men fear women so, that for ages they've resorted to control struggles and debasement, enslavement, violence and violations, yet to no avail and way too much fucking harm. You're still stronger, guys, always will be. Live longer, endure more, 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 create more, destroy more, control more, and get more. Just look at the markets and shop windows, and where do you find men's clothing, but tucked away in a back corner or basement or the fourth floor. And when you get there, what do you see most and more often than not is women clothing their men. Apart from the classy men-only stores where you have the privilege of being dressed by lady men. If this were a man's world, there'd be a urinal in every household bathroom. But guess what? Better sit down and learn to piss straight, boy, because this is Earth, the female planet, and the joke and yoke is truly on you. 
pray to our feminine form, feast in delighting us, liberate the goddess, set free the witches, unleash the wisdom, let the wizards dance and dare to face the emanation, the vision, the raw beastly beauty of free womanhood. Beyond sirens, mermaids, furies, Valkyrie guarded doors hung with skulls and sliced off genitalia, cocks, fingers, and tongues of men too weak to accept and complement the power of the nether Amazons beyond those gates and the pearly clitoris bridge over vulvic waters. There lies the true fountain of youth, the sweet honey of ecstasy, excreting fountain of succulent, everlasting love for all that is, this planet and way beyond. And in that fountain reflected, see the face of true manhood, your own face, your own true face beyond veils and masks. Pray at the vulvic altar till the relentless sensual journey to her utter satisfaction and orgasm space engulfs us all, and your rocket burns through its last drops of fuel and drops down to earth.